Hello mortals, it is your Valkyrie Princess Darby. Today's episode, The Scarlet Space Babe, will be joining me to talk about the 1995 film Showgirls, an erotic drama written by Joe Ezerterhaas and directed by Paul Verhoeven, starring Elizabeth Berkley, Kyle MacLachlan, and Gina Gershon. So let's get started, and welcome to The Babes of Valhalla. Content may not be suitable if you are underage, closed-minded, or immature. We discuss topics that are graphic and sexual in nature. So just as a brief kind of introduction to the kind of overview of the film if you haven't seen it, Uh, The film centers on a street-smart drifter who ventures to Las Vegas and climbs the seedy hierarchy from stripper to showgirl. I also have some interesting facts about the movie that I'm kicking myself that we didn't read before we watched it and also talked about it because I think it's really interesting. So hopefully you guys find these interesting as well. So Showgirls was the first and to date only NC-17 rated film to be given a wide release in mainstream theaters. Audience restriction due to the NC-17 rating, coupled with poor reviews, resulted in the film becoming a box office bomb, grossing only $37 million. Although, despite negative theatrical and critical consensus, Showgirls enjoyed success on the home video market, generating more than $100 million from video rentals, allowing the film to turn a profit and become one of MGM's top 20 all-time bestsellers. Despite being consistently ranked as one of the worst films ever made, Showgirls has become regarded as a cult film, was released on Blu-ray in June 2010, and has been subject to critical re-evaluation, with some notable directors and critics declaring it a serious satire worthy of praise. So I also thought that this was interesting, that um, the writer and director interviewed over 200 Las Vegas strippers and incorporated parts of their stories in the screenplay to show the amount of exploitation of strippers in Vegas, I also think it's interesting that in the credits, I don't see the 200 Las Vegas strippers named that they interviewed. Um, It could be for a variety of reasons. And I wonder also if they got paid, which I could not find. If anybody has information on either of those two things, that would be, I'd be interested to know. Um, Apparently, Ezra Haas took out a full page advertisement in Variety in which he dubbed the film a morality tale and denounced the advertising of the film as misguided, also writing, The movie shows that dancers in Vegas are often victimized, humiliated, used, verbally and physically raped by the men who are at the power centers of that world. Uh, Which is also interesting. When we talk about the movie a little bit more, you can kind of make your own assumptions or, I guess, your own decisions about that. Um, And if you've seen the movie, I'd be curious to know uh, what people think. That quote is interesting to me because I don't necessarily know if that's what I got out of it but we'll get into it in a little bit um also Elizabeth Berkeley, who previously was in Saved by the Bell she took this movie this ro- she took this role she was only 20 years old this is a pretty adult role to be in at 20 um going from Saved by the Bell which from what I remember is a pretty wholesome like teenage a TV show, like sitcom, and this movie is, you know, an erotic drama, it's got nudity, a lot of sex, a lot of sexuality in it, um, apparently Elizabeth Berkeley was dropped by her agent, Mike Menchel, following the film's release, and other agents refused to take her telephone calls, and I guess that kind of bothered me when I read that, because... Elizabeth Berkley was only 20 years old and she'd been really successful on her previous project, Saved by the Bell. So they cast her in this really adult, highly sexual movie and then they're maybe surprised that she doesn't do as well. Playing a character that's existing within very adult themes and dealing with a lot of very adult, very dramatic, very violent kind of scenarios that 
in my personal experience at 20, I don't think that I would have had the ability to visualize or put myself in that headspace. So I don't know. I thought that was interesting. Apparently the film was banned in 1995, uh, November 8th, 1995 by Ireland. The rights to show the film on TV were eventually purchased by VH1. However, because of the film's frequent nudity, a censored version was created with black bras and panties digitally rendered to hide all exposed breasts and genitalia, and several scenes were removed entirely. Apparently, Berkeley refused to redub her lines because MGM refused to pay her fee of $250. Um, so notably, noticeably different actresses' voices can be heard on the soundtrack. And my last little bit, in 1998 interview, Jacques Servette called it one of the great American films of the last few years, although very unpleasant. It's about surviving in a world populated by assholes, and that's for Hooven's philosophy. Quentin Tarantino has stated that he enjoyed Showgirls, referring to it in 1996 as the only other time in the last 20 years that a major studio made a full-on, gigantic, big-budget exploitation movie, and he compared it to Mandingo. So that's just some things to think about as we're going, um, kind of talking about it. This is also our first time doing a movie review. So I'd be interested to kind of know your thoughts and opinions on it and what you thought about what we thought and maybe what you think about this movie or how you kind of want us to do movie reviews in the future. Just things to think about. Um, All right, so let's get into it. So we are back today with Scarlett, who you have heard from a couple other episodes. So hello, Scarlett. Hello. (laughs) And we just finished watching the 1995 film Showgirls. Um, So we are going to start doing some movie reviews or just discussions about movies that feature sex workers or sex work and just kind of talk about them. So Showgirls has been one of my favorite sex work movies but Scarlett had not seen it yet so we just started watching it uh so Scarlett what did you think about it (laughs) (laughs) um I enjoyed the film a lot it was not exactly what I expected uh it ended up being a lot grittier than I thought it was gonna be um it reminded me of Pulp Fiction that type of like gritty like, film without a real timeline. Um, mm-hmm. It's just kind of, like, it's just happening in a place and time that's just, is what's, it is what it is at the time. It's just going on in the world somewhere. It's not like, you know, like a superhero film where you're like, this is the story from start to finish. There's no real backstory and there's no real conclusion. Yeah, and there's not really, like, it's not satisfying mm-hmm. when you're done with it. At least I don't ever feel that way. I always feel like there should be more. Like a what next? What happened y- next? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, So if you're not familiar with the film, this is going to have spoilers in it. And uh, it basically takes place in Vegas. And Nomi is the main character. And she is um, a drifter coming in to Vegas with the dreams of kind of becoming a, like, showgirl um, Vegas dancer type (laughs) thing. She ends up... Becoming a stripper at the Cheetah Club, which does still exist in Vegas. And I'm super curious to know if... It still looks like that. Yeah, because it looks so cool. It has, like, these neon, like, cheetahs on the walls and stuff. (laughs) And we knew a girl at the club that we started at that worked at Cheetahs. And she said that everything was, like, cheetah print. Mm -hmm. But um, I like the, like, early 90s, like, glam that they have in the movie. So one of the things that we talked about was... The shoes? Yeah. Their dancer shoes were not at all what we would consider dancer shoes. Yeah, nobody was wearing, like, the clear heels. The clear, like, six-inch, nine-inch, or, sorry, nine is, like, really high, but, like, five, five, not even five and a half inches. They were wearing, like, like, uh, ballroom dance shoes. Yeah, they weren't even tall. Yeah, they were, like, maybe four inches, three and a half inches, like, kitten heels, basically. Well, what I, I mean... Compared to, like, I usually end up wearing eight and a half inch heels that are eight and a half inches tall. And they're like a platform. No, these girls did not have that. All their shoes were flexible. Or even some of them were wearing, like, a clunky, like, 90s eighth grade dance 
type shoes, like the thick heel, like a platform, but like a little platform, but that was like really chunky, like a little decorative over the toes and then an ankle strap type of shoe. So I thought that was like interesting because for us, the dancer heel is very like, like it's a very specific shoe. Like we see new girls coming in, coming in to with the club all the time and they are wearing like regular heels that you would wear like to a club or on a date and we're like don't wear those your shoes are gonna break and you're gonna fall on your ass and then they're like oh my gosh really and I'm like yeah according to the internet that clear shoes or stripper shoes were created by Salvatore Ferragamo in 1947 wow in a book apparently called a celebration of pumps sandals and slippers and more Author Linda O'Keefe traced the origins of the modern clear heel to an invisible sandal created by Salvatore Ferragamo. Hmm. Which, that's interesting. So they don't, so again, I don't know really why they're not wearing them. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, and I also thought their dance moves were also different. I mean, I know that, like, twerking and um, a lot of the stuff that, like, is more popular now has not always been popular. Like I, I mean, mm-hmm. I, we knew that, but it was just like, yeah, just like a different type of dancing. That was interesting. Yeah. Just seeing the, and then watching them kind of pole dance, but not really pole dance. Whereas like, I yeah, guess there wasn't like tricks. Really yeah. At all. Like they would climb and kind of spin around, but they didn't do any, anything close to what we would consider like competition style pole dancing now days like not even close and they had that huge stage at cheetahs that was like one pole on one end and one pole on the other end but in the middle was like where all this show was happening and it was like like you're like she was doing putting on a show like an actual show because she's here to dance and not like put on like a regular pole show because now i think there's a lot of strip clubs that have big huge stages but like the pole is like the center yeah and i definitely think like it's I mean, also, like, strip clubs have moved away from, like, where you put on, like, a, you know, 10 to 15 minute performance. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's, like, we all just kind of go around and it's, like, a little carousel of dancers. It's, like, less... Dancers on parade. Yeah, they're, like, performing, but it's, there's less of, like, a act kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. Uh, The other thing we were talking about was, like, their body types. Yeah, the the shape that was popular back then, (laughs) I guess, that's the right way to put it. They didn't have any butts. Yeah, and, like, no butts. But also, like, the big fake tit thing really wasn't a thing. Yeah, the, um, the, like, lead dancer of the Vegas show, her name's Crystal, she and Nomi have a scene where they're drinking champagne in the Paris um, casino. Crystal is talking about how, you know, a lot of makeup and a surgeon make a big difference. And that, you know, she has, like, big big tits now and we were both looking at each other like what are you talking about those are like i guess they seem like normal they also look natural so i don't actually think that that actress got anything done yeah i don't know maybe maybe we're wrong but yeah her boobs weren't huge and now i feel like it's like girls don't even like if not everybody but i feel like it's more common if you get your boobs done you're going for a lot of a bigger like a, a double or triple D. Yeah. I mean, most of our friends, at least, that have had their boobs on have gone Definitely to a D at least bigger. that big. Yeah. yeah. And then, it seemed like back then, it was more about the, like, if you had A cups, then maybe you'd go to a C, but you really wouldn't go to, like, like she said, like a double D, or like a E, or whatever. Like Yeah, they, they weren't like Barbie doll boobs. They were, like, where they sit on top. I mean, they just looked, like, natural. Yeah. Normal, I don't know. I guess that's hard, too, in a movie. Like, it's hard to, like... I mean, now maybe not so much because, of, like, the technology is a little bit different, but maybe back then it was hard to fake, like, a a boob job. I don't know. Because she wasn't wearing a bra half the film, so <laughs> you can't really yeah. Or and, but it, maybe know. they just were like, it's fine. People don't know. I mean, yeah. guys definitely don't. I don't feel like always know. Yeah, they... <laughs> so, I don't know. This is, like, a NC-17 rated movie in 1995, so... All the men that were watching it were just like, oh, yeah, I guess that's what boob jobs look like. They yeah. look natural. Yeah. <laughs> so, so nice. 
nice. So then the other thing that we both were laughing about was the white girl that had the braids the entire show. Yeah. And they weren't even good. <laughs> yeah. They I weren't didn't, even well done. <laughs> I don't know. And I don't. I still don't understand why she had them because I was kind of thinking like, Maybe it was just, like, the hair they were doing, like, she has, like, because they all kind of had this, like, um, they were doing this, like, exotic, like, ride a volcano thing. Like, the Vegas show was, like, volcanoes, then there's, like, a BDSM motorcycle thing, then there's, like, mirror dresses with, like, red wig thing. Yeah. So I thought maybe, like, the braids were part of, like, the... The costume. Yeah, the costume, but... She just had them the entire time. They never changed. I don't know. Well, and the other part that was weird about the braids, too, is at one point in the movie, her two little children are there in the film, and I'm thinking, okay, maybe she's, like, half black or something, or maybe her husband is black and whatever. That's why she has braids. No. Her two little kids come into the scene, and they're these, like, two little, like, (laughs) pasty white children. (laughs) One of them has, like, a... Like a goody two 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 shoes like bob haircut that like yeah. flips up at the end and I'm just like what? <laughs> this makes no sense. So well, yeah, the braids are weird. And it was weird because she's the one that had the rival with the only black dancer. Yeah, who she, had no hair. I, mean, I guess just like with everything that everyone like everyone's kind of talking about right now. And you and I have talked about this a lot, but like, so she's the white girl that has the braids, mm-hmm. and she's like fighting and also um like being passive aggressive and then eventually escalating to aggressiveness with the only other with the only other the only black dancer in the in the show in the show yeah which then results in like her getting injured it's interesting too because she never they never actually bring up race like throughout the whole film actually i was kind of surprised that no one ever mentioned like anything really about race like, there was never, like, a, you're just an angry black bitch or whatever, or, you know, like, nothing like that. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was kind of cool that they didn't include that, because they easily, it easily could have gone that way. Well, they also used a lot of really derogatory language towards women, period. Oh, so yeah. I can see how, yeah, you would be like, oh, I guess this is going to come down. But yeah, they didn't say anything about any of that. Yeah, especially, well, there's a scene we'll talk about later in, in that scene that I was surprised they didn't say anything to. But... Yeah. Well, yeah, no, it was just, that was an interesting dynamic, because you would think, like, now if they redid the film, um, we were talking about this earlier a little bit, if you, if they redid the film, would that even be a dynamic that's also included? Would the races be reversed? Would there not be a girl, a white girl with braids? Would there still be a white girl with braids? Mm -hmm. Would there just be two black girls or two white girls or a Mexican chick and an Asian chick? You know what I mean? Like, how would that play out in, like, a remake? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Or if they would just avoid it altogether. Well, I just I just want to understand the style choice. Mm-hmm. Like, why was the hairstylist lady like, okay, we have, like, Nomi, the main character, who has, like, really, really, really curly blonde hair. Mm-hmm. Then we have, like, the, um, the black actress. We're going to cut her hair, keep it really short. Mm-hmm. Then we have the white girl. Oh, you know what? We're going to give her braids. braids. <laughs> like, I don't understand, like... I don't know. I just, I guess I just don't. And then they had like a, a white girl that had like the really dyed red hair. Yeah. And her hair was kind of natural, like kind of wavy, sort of like flipped or whatever. But yeah, yeah I just didn't, I just didn't understand Well, and then they that. had the, the Molly, the best friend girl who's black, who has braids, but her braids, and the difference between the braids was like visual. Like you could see yeah. Molly's braids were war- more, definitely more well done than this other girls yeah, braids. they were like loose the white girl had like they were like loose braids yeah like it didn't look i guess basically the way i put it like molly looked like she had experience doing braids or the character i guess whatever and then the white girl looked like she just was like i'm gonna put braids in my hair one day and then just kind of like did it yeah and just did it every day forever yeah <laughs> It was weird. Like, that was definitely weird. Uh, yeah. It was interesting. Interesting style choice, like I said. Yeah, I just want to, I want to be in the room with that, when that conversation was happening. But again, I mean, it was in the early 90s where I don't think that that was on the forefront, perhaps. That's like a conversation that people maybe don't even have. They're just like, yeah. oh, this will be fun. The thing that we were thinking of was the similarities and differences, like, in the cheetah club to our own experience Mm -hmm. so i thought it was interesting like the dichotomy between like the manager and the house mom 
Well, I think she kind of was playing like a house mom. They have kind of this like comical, like, um, like woman who's like kind of bigger, not really like, she's kind of like looks like her makeup's like really intense, almost like drag queeny sort Mm -hmm. of. And she would come out and like do these like comedy sets on stage in the Cheetah Club. And all her jokes were like, I mean, the ones at least that I could make out were, like, really horrible, like, about women that were, like, really cringy. Like, she was like, uh, you know, what do they call the extra skin around, or what What was it? It was like, what, what, do, they, they, what do they call the extra skin by the cunt or somewhere? Around the a twat or something. Twat, yeah. And they were like, a woman. Yeah. And I was just like, ugh, <laughs> gross. Like, I don't know. That's just, that was, like, cringy. But anyways... They have, like, this dichotomy between, like, the manager being this, like, total... Slime ball. Yeah, slime ball, <laughs> a creep. But then also, there's, like, this weird, like, family kind of, like, bond thing. Because then, like, later, the house mom and the owner of the club, or the manager, or whatever, mm-hmm. come to Nomi's... Show. Like, show, yeah. And they, and they like, congratulate her and, like, whatever... But then he, like, ruins it, because as he walks away, he was like, it must be weird not to have people come on you yeah. anymore. And we were just like, what the fuck? It could have <laughs> been, like, you could have turned it around. Yeah, it could have been a nice moment, and nope. Although there was that weird part right before he says that, where he, like, has his hands on her face, and it looks like maybe it could have been a hug, like, leading to a hug, but then it could have been a kiss, like, it could have looked like he was trying to kiss her. That was a little, like... What are you doing here? Why is your hand on her face like that? Like, it was strangely intimate for the moment they were having. Yeah. And then, of course, he ruins it with the cum comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was it's... funny, though, when he was, like, describing to the new girl, like, the rules. Yeah. And it was like, uh... <laughs> if you... Don't let them touch you. Unless they offer you a huge tip, then it's okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> She's and like, then, what? <laughs> and then he was like, it was like, if they come in their pants, okay, fine. He's like, but if they pull it out... And come on you. No. Unless they pay you enough, then it's fine. Yeah. Is that okay? And the girl is just like, uh. <laughs> yeah. Because when he, when he goes, they can't, they're not allowed to touch you. They can't touch you. She's like, oh, okay, good. And then he's like, but if. And she goes, what? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. I look super confused. And, like, yeah, I mean, pretty much. Like, that's how I felt, I think, like, upon entering the industry. You're like, okay, so what's allowed? And they're like, well, this is not allowed. Unless they pay you this much money. Or, but you can't do this, unless you get this much money. But you can't do this, unless you get this much money. And you're like, so what's not allowed? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I did, actually, I thought the um, house mom lady, I thought, I thought she was a drag queen. Like, I thought that was part of her, like, shtick. But then, she's in makeup and stuff the whole film. So then I was like, okay, then she's not a drag queen. I've never had a house mom... So I think if I was gonna have one, though, I'd want one like that because she was she seemed like generally supportive of the girls, and then having that like weird comic relief thing in the middle of the show <laughs> was kind of an interesting idea too. Because like, I guess I would wonder how long do their shifts last? What is it like? Because they go they all go on stage at once, and then they yeah. did this weird doubles routine at one point. Yeah, where they all got naked and they were like humping each other and stuff. <laughs> yeah, like, that was like not clear. That was not clear. Like, we want to understand the structure of this stri- movie strip clubs shifts. <laughs> yeah, like what do you start? Is that the beginning? <sighs> and then the part when, so when Crystal and um, Zach, her entertainment director slash whatever guy, mm-hmm. come in, is that the beginning of the night? The end of the night? The middle of the night? This is the only thing about the movie. There was zero timelines whatsoever. It was either yeah, nighttime that's totally or it was true. daytime. There that's was totally no. True. It's noonish or it's close to midnight. They never mentioned times, dates, anything. Yeah, that's totally true. I mean, we kind of got the idea. I guess that it was Christmas when she first gets hired because of the decorations. But yeah, I mean, there was no like. Now it's New Year's. Like there was no. Yeah, no. That yeah, there wasn't anything. It was really strange. Yeah. So it's... and because it's Vegas, it all looks it looks the same all year. Mm-hmm. So you, I mean. It was like it said like you know seasons greetings and whatever behind the secretary's desk, but there was never any mention of Christmas or New Year's or whatever. So you don't like there was no sense of how long had 
Nomi been there? How long had she been in the show? How long had she been? Like, all that stuff. It was just... Yeah, that part was a little bit weird. Yeah. And, like, there's a couple parts where the manager mentioned, oh, you're running, you're late, you're late again. And she's like, uh, come on again, you just left me to do this. How many times has this girl been late? Uh-huh. <laughs> but other than that, like, the cheetahs, the, like, inside of the club was pretty crazy, like, with all the neon lights that we talked about earlier and the stage and stuff, and it seemed like, I don't know, like, it was, like, an interesting dynamic all around between yeah. all the other dancers and then the, the, and then the dynamic differently too from the showgirl set that she's on with the other dancers professional dancers i guess if you want to differentiate it that way versus like the camaraderie i guess at the strip club mm. where the girls are i mean i friendly definitely, together yeah like i would still consider us professional dancers but also like there's less it's less competitive there which is kind of like an odd thing because you would think it would be the other way around because we're not we're competing for money, but we know that there's enough to go around, whereas, like, they're competing for parts, and there's never enough parts to go around. Yeah, they're competing for, like, the top spot. hmm Yeah. No, I'm 100%. And there's kind of this, like, vibe where it's, like, the professional dancers for the showgirls show, you know, they're, like, better than. hmm Whereas, like, when you're in the strip club with, like, the other girls, they're all kind of, like, doing the same thing and Nomi didn't leave the club being like I'm better than all of this she just left like I'm moving on to the next thing it wasn't about putting the other girls down it was just she was moving on to the next thing and the other girls at the show girls like um thing like they were all about kind of putting each other down and clawing over each other to get to like this top spot mm-hmm. so yeah no, I definitely understand that um and speaking of the other girls we were also talking about like the stereotyping Mm-hmm. That was in the movie, like specifically we mentioned before, like the um, black dancer, who I don't think that she had one line that she wasn't screaming. Yeah, like there was no. I mean, she was like angry the entire time. Yeah, she is definitely the stereotypical angry black woman in the film. Yeah, which I was uncomfortable. I don't think I remember thinking that when I first watched the movie, but then when I watched it this time, I was like, oh man, like yeah, that's super. Yeah. And then they got rid of her. They, like, killed her off, basically, like, really yeah. early on. Yeah. She breaks her knee or something, right? Yeah, and she's, and like, in the, in the, in the, in the, well, I guess the world of the film, she's not the only black woman in the film, but she's one of two black women that actually have speaking parts, and she was gone halfway through the film. So they have yeah. one other one that's left, that's Molly, the best friend, who is there the whole film, start to finish, but she, even she, like, doesn't have that many lines. Yeah. Yeah. And she's, like, yeah, and the angry, she was definitely, like, that type of definition of the stereotypical angry black woman, which I thought was interesting. And, like, and I thought also, like, talked about earlier, that it's interesting that she's feuding with the only other person in the room, wind braids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which is a white person. Which is just, I don't know, interesting. <laughs> Which I'm sure that they didn't set that up. I mean, I don't know, obviously. Maybe they did, but it seemed like it wasn't necessarily set up that way on purpose. Like, she could have easily been feuding with the red-headed girl. Or the girl with braids could have just not had braids. But it's just kind of, like, interesting that it worked out in that way. That you're mm-hmm. like, maybe she's just pissed because she took her braids. Like, <laughs> I don't know. But then also the other thing I thought was interesting about this film is there's no backstory. Yeah, to any of them. Yeah, so we don't know why these two girls are feuding. We have no idea. They just hate each other from the get-go. Like, from the very first scene they're in together, they Mm -hmm. hate each other. Yeah. Yeah, so it kind of made it... It kind of dehumanized the black woman a little bit because now she's just angry because she's black, which kind of was, like, interesting. Well, then you also were talking about a little bit, like, what you thought about Molly, the Nomi's best friend, who Nomi actually meets her... Her first day in Vegas, Nomi gets there. Her suitcase gets stolen by the guy who gave her a ride. And she has nothing, and she's freaking out. And um, Molly meets her outside of, I guess, the Stardust, the casino that she ends up working in, um, like, having a meltdown. And she takes her to go get, like, a burger and fries or something and talk about stuff and ends up, like, letting her stay at her house, like, her trailer while she gets 
like set up while Nomi gets set up and gets a job and figures it out Mm. so that's like how they met and now they're like best friends but you had also mentioned like kind of feeling like that was also a stereotypical relationship I don't know if you want to talk about that yeah so how I'm like there's always like when you have like a white friend and a black friend there's usually at least in movies I've seen there's always usually like that like the best friend is there to like pump up the white girl like I guess um have you seen Honey you've seen Honey Mm -hmm. yeah I've seen Honey and her best friend is black. And her best friend can't dance, can't do any of the things that Honey does. She's just there to, like, boost honey, Honey's ego and be the mm. best friend and, like, be there for her when she's hurt and stuff like that. And then, so in this film, it was very, like, a similar dynamic where she's, the best friend is a seamstress. And she's the reason that Nomi even got to see the show in the beginning because she mm. came to work with Nomi one day. Or came to work with Molly, who's the seamstress on the show. Um, one day and like fell in love with the whole idea and that's how she that's where she got the idea that she wanted to be in that specific show and then her friend's like responsibility beyond that point is to like I guess like take care of her like coddle her not coddle I guess that's the wrong word but like look after her kind of like she's Molly's very much like a mother figure Mm. slash best friend in Nomi's life yeah beyond that point and they, yeah, and they live together, and, and Molly takes her in with, like, no hesitation, and she's just like, you know, come stay with me, and, like, you know, and just kind of looks after her, and she does, she, like, knows how to cheer her up. She, like, in the, one of the beginning scenes, um, Nomi gets upset because, um, Crystal makes a comment about her not being a real dancer because she tells her she works at Cheetah's, mm-hmm. and she's upset, and her, and Molly goes, come on, let's go. And she's like, where are we going? And she's like, you know where we're going. And they go dancing. <laughs> yeah. And Nomi starts a fight, but that's the other point. <laughs> Which actually brings us to the other thing we were thinking about with stereotyping is um, there's a scene where they go, where they're at the club, and she meets this dude. So he's black, he has dreads, he's like skinny black dude. And he is like your classic stereotype of like, shitty black guy who goes after white girls and, like, preys on white women. Like, you're, I guess. And he was, like, really, like, they they play, made him, like, aggressive. Mm-hmm. He was, like, calling them, like, bitch. Mm-hmm. Like, right off the bat. And then, yeah, like, you know, this, like, like, broke liar, cheater. He, like, had that line where he was, like, I'm just addicted to pussy or something. Yeah. I don't know. They didn't give him, like, a... Like, I think we were supposed to like him. Yeah. But... Like, he was just shitty. Yeah. Just totally shitty. And that's the other thing that I thought was weird, too, is, like, no, we didn't end up... Like, nobody really had a love interest. Mm-hmm. Like, all of the relationships, except for between Nomi and Holly, or, I'm sorry, Molly, mm-hmm. all the relationships, between, except between Nomi and Molly, were these, like, fake, like, empty relationships. Like, even... When, you know, James tells her that he's marrying Penny, which is another white girl from the strip club, mm-hmm. uh, it's only because Penny's pregnant. And mm-hmm. Nomi asked, oh, do you love her? Well, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe one day I will or something like that. Yeah. And, and they then- just, like, he had the, no character at all. He was just there to just be, like, and he was, like, really pushy. Yeah, and, like, he he bailed her out of jail when she started, when she got into a fight and then expected her to just, like bend over backwards for him which like yeah okay thanks for bailing me out of jail random stranger yeah <laughs> yeah and he like shows up at her house randomly and doesn't get why she's upset yeah and he's she's know. like are you stalking me and then he like takes her home to his place um to do to like i think and that scene was kind of odd like so he brought her back to his house he was gonna teach teach her this dance that he made up for her out of nowhere um, yeah, after meeting her, like, one and a half times. Yeah, and then they start dancing, and obviously it starts turning into a sex scene, kind of, because, but then she, like, she stops him when he starts putting her hand down her pants, because she's like, oh, my baby, period. Oh, this is the best, though. I love this scene. Yeah, and he's like, really? And Because he doesn't believe her, which also was kind of like, really? Yeah. You think you're just entitled to that, like, right off the bat, but okay. And then she's like, yeah, you can check. So he does. And pulls his hands out. What do you think is there? And it's, and she just starts laughing. And we started laughing. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, he was such a, like... 
He was the type of dude that your mom would like warn you about when you go to the club for the first time. He has a couple good lines like when she first meets or first like starts talking to Zach, which is the entertainment director at the um, Vegas casino. Mm -hmm. He, Zach buys her flowers for her first performance night. She is coming out of the hotel room. James is outside as the, what, valet? Valet. Or the... Yeah, valet. The suitcase person. Suitcase valet. Something. He has like a million... A bellhop. Yeah, he has a bellhop. He has like a million jobs in the whole movie. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, Nomi and him are, are chatting... James and then Zach pulls up in his like fancy car and Nomi goes over and says oh thanks for the flowers or something and and he says oh you know he's the one to buy the flowers what is he a pimp and she says no he's the entertainment director and she kind of has like this attitude he's like well yeah that's what I said he's a pimp and it's kind of like foreshadowing Mm -hmm. the rest of the things in the movie because Zach is kind of like cast as and we were talking about this while we were watching it though it really seems like he normally this is the character that he plays. He's, like, the good guy. Like, you know, he looks good on paper. He's, like, the one that your parents would be like, oh, yeah, what a great guy. But really, yeah, he's, like, lighter. a... Yeah, total skis ball, dirt bag, you know, just a... He's just really good at being a snake. Yeah, he's just a snake, exactly. So it kind of, like, foretells that, you know, he's... Yeah, like, this idea of... of that, you know, he's, like, as the entertainment director, he's, like, a pimp. So that was, like, a good line from him. Mm-hmm. But... Then at the same time, like, you don't like him. Yeah, he's just... Like, at one point, he goes... At the end, when he tells Nomi he's gonna marry Penny, he tells her to go get him a drink, and he's like, go get me a drink, bitch. Oh, my God, I hated that. What? <laughs> that oh, was... and and when they got done dancing on the stage, because James choreographs the piece for Nomi. Nomi doesn't want to do it, so he has Penny do it instead of her. And Nomi goes to go see them perform it. When they're talking at the end of the show, she's like, oh, you guys did such a great job. And he said, no, we didn't. She can't dance. She dances like a brick or like a block of... a truck or something. A truck or something. Yeah, he says something like a block of wood. I can't remember. It was like, that is so fucking mean. Yeah, and then it also like makes it clear like the dynamic between him and Nomi and him and Penny in that it's clear that Penny is his second choice. And then he's treating her like he's just being, like, abusive. So now he's the abusive, like, broke black man that's, yeah, like, like that, that predator, predat- pre- preying on white women. Mm-hmm. Which also, yeah, the, like it was, like, all the horrible stereotypes that you could possibly have. Yeah, like, the only thing he needed was to be a gangster, and that would have, like... And he was short. Yeah, and he was short <laughs> and skinny. And then it was funny because they were like, oh, he was an Alvin Ailey dancer. So you, like, have this, like idea of him even though when you first meet him he's kind of a dick and then he tells her he danced for Alvin Ailey so I guess you kind of have this like expectation that maybe he's better than we think like he's gonna gonna have more depth his character has no depth yeah who is this person and I understand the the reason for having him in the film he's kind of like I don't know like teaching her a lesson that extra little kick in the ass like (laughs) people are shitty and yeah and be careful they're 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 it's not what it cracks up to be well, this is the other part that was frustrating. So when he first meets her, he meets her out dancing. Mm-hmm. Then he bails her out of jail. Then he finds her at the cheetah club that she works at. He watches her give a dance. Then, at the end of that, when he goes, what, to her house or something? Mm-hmm. He's talking to her and he's like, you're better than that. You have a passion in you. You can actually dance. Like, you shouldn't be there selling tits and ass and fucking people without fucking them and, like, yeah. stuff like that. So he's, like, putting her down about dancing. Then she goes and gets a job as a professional dancer. And he gets upset. And he gets upset about that and puts her down about that. And then he says, well, at least, you know, what you're doing at Cheetahs is honest. They want tits and ass. You show them tits and ass. But here, you know, at the Stardust, they're trying to make it something else. And you're still showing them tits and ass. Yeah. And I was like, okay, what? (laughs) Like, so she just, it doesn't matter. And, like, I thought that that was interesting. It's like, well, no matter what women do, right? Yeah. If it has to do with your sexuality and being in charge of it, you're you're wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't matter what she does. She's, uh, it's just going to be in the wrong. Yeah, exactly. And and some man is going to explain to her, tell her. Mansplain to her. Exactly. (laughs) What she's supposed to be doing with her own body. And part of it, I think, is that she is naive to what's going on. But I don't think that she's stupid. Yeah. 
Um, but then moving on to our next thing, kind of speaking of the way that, like, men and people were talking to each other, the movie is just, like, full of harassment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> there's, like, one scene where um, the angry black woman is going up, or she's, like, getting... I don't even think she gets a name. No, she doesn't, but the braids girl doesn't have a name either. She's just braids girl. I don't, I don't remember her name um, either. I thought, yeah, I can't remember her name. That's true. Yeah. So... The black lady, anyway, she's getting her costume fixed by Molly at one point as they're about to start another show round. And the only, they make a joke out of it, but the only straight guy in the chorus line comes up and basically, like, unfortunately I have to quote our stupid trash president, but he basically grabs her by the pussy and then, like, puts his, like, I wish I could have a visual, but he, like, puts his hand, like, all the way up her ass cheeks and then grabs her, like... Mm. You know, and she's like, "What the heck? What the heck are you doing? What the fuck?" Da, 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 da. And everybody, and she, they're freaking out. He's like, "Oh, you shouldn't complain because you're the only girl, or you're the only girl with a straight partner." And she's like, uh. "What the fuck?" And then the two gay guys kind of come to her defense, and they're like, and so they like grab his dick, and they're like, "Oh, what does it look like under the light?" And they're like harassing him a little bit, but like it's still like that fire for fire type, like thing like he's not gonna stop doing it because they're now harassing him if anything it's gonna make him worse well it was pretty much like all of the cis men in the show which is like 99.999 percent of all the men just were absolutely horrible to every oh, single all, all the women the women yeah all every single one of them there was no positive male male things. characters whatsoever and there was very few like female positive characters too because they were all just harassing each other but the sexual harassment on all fronts was like ridiculous yeah i mean the strip club it was i don't know why i was less bothered by it in the strip club i think it's because you kind of expect it there Mm. especially because like i mean that's still a shitty way that we have to deal with things but like you kind of expect it because it's that type of environment where a man comes and feels like they can like let loose in that type of way. Yeah, and like say, oh, I want to see your ass or whatever. And you're yeah, just like, okay. Or they will walk by and slap you on the ass because you're not wearing any, like not wearing clothes, basically. Yeah, but then she goes and gets this like, you know, real, quote unquote, like right, real job as a professional dancer and she's getting treated the same, if not worse. Yeah. Which. And then, yeah, and like you yeah. said, by the other women too, because there's the one scene where they're rehearsing mm-hmm. her and Crystal, and Crystal pulls her top down and then, like, yeah. is like playing with her boots. Or even when she's yeah, that auditioning. Yeah, super weird. Yeah. And when, or when she's auditioning for the part and they want to humiliate her by get, making her nipples hard so they put, they get off her ice cubes. Like, that was just. Probably so, unnecessary. Yeah, completely unnecessary. Because it's clear that she got the part because she's good. Yeah. Um, even with Crystal's influence, it's clear that she's a good dancer, but it's like, why do you need to bring it to that? Like, why, I guess why, as far as the women go, do they all felt like they needed to assert dominance over all of the other women? Mm. Because even Nomi at at some points feels like she needs to assert dominance over, um, Crystal as well. Yeah, yeah, well, and then Crystal kind of had the same... She was, like, kind of a predator, too. Like, a sexual predator. And that was also weird. There was, like... There was, like, a lot of undertones in the movie that were sometimes hard to, like, manage because there were so many. Because there was, like, lesbian undertones that, like, didn't really get resolved one way or the other. Because when Nomi first meets um, Molly, she's, like, asking her if she's hitting on her. Mm -hmm. Then, like, when Nomi and... Crystal are rehearsing, like you said. Crystal's, like, fondling her. Mm-hmm. Um, Crystal, like, goes to the cheetah to, like, see... Or that goes to the cheetah and sees Nomi there and, like, buys a lap dance for her then-boyfriend, Zach. Zach, that's, like, interesting. And it's, like, very sexual for all of them. Mm-hmm. I don't know. And then there's this, like, you know, dichotomy between, like... Like, the, the idea of you know like what makes you a whore kind of is coming up all the time like there's just a lot of moving parts that like never really get explained or resolved they're all like kind of just underneath the surface a little bit Mm -hmm. it's like yeah everybody there's not really any characters that you like really other than for me at least Nomi and Molly. Molly yeah and Molly's like 
I guess Molly would be, for lack of a better term, the cinnamon roll of the film because she's like, you know. She's super sweet. There's no way you can have an issue with her. Yeah, she's nice to everybody. She doesn't, she does no need to assert dominance or be a bitch or be toxic or be competitive mm-hmm. with anybody because she's the only one who does what she does. And she's, in the movie, they make it seem like she's the best. Yeah. She has her own. And she's in school and that was kind of an interesting thing that they never mm-hmm. resolved either because like... At one point, she's talking about getting her associate's degree, and there was, like, one quick little, like, of like words. Loop. Yeah. And then that was it. So it kind of, that kind of seemed pointless, but I think it was to add to, like, like the likability of Molly, because she's, like, mm. going somewhere with her life, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. She's, like, yeah, working towards something. Well, then... Speaking of Molly. Speaking of Molly. So, there's a scene that I knew was coming, but I oh, forgot... Wait. Trigger warning for uh, yeah. rape and um, like abuse. the hard discussion. Yeah, abuse. Yeah, beatings. Definitely. Disclaimer. Yes. <laughs> so I knew it was coming, but I forgot how like bad it was. But basically, like Molly has like a crush on this like singer that's coming to Vegas. And she's like, oh my gosh, you know, like, they have, like, a little scene where she's like, oh, he's so amazing, like, oh, I wouldn't even know what to say to him, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, Nomi gets the top spot eventually, she's, like, dating Zach, she's, like, replaced Crystal, she's living the life, she's like, come to this party, you can meet Zach. A- and- oh, Andrew. Oh, Andrew Carver. Andrew Carver. Hmm. So she shows up, Nomi hooks her, hooks her up with Andrew Carver, there, you know, he gets her a drink, they're hanging out. Everything um, looks nice on the surface. Yes, everything looks nice on the surface. They're, like, kissing. She kind of, like, consents to walk down this hallway, like, go to a room, basically, with him. Then she's in the room, and all of a sudden, the energy changes. There's, like, two other guys in the room. Which are apparently his bodyguards. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, big guys. They're, all of these men are huge. Very strong men. Yeah, compared and, to her, she's this tiny little... Yeah, she's really tiny. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, they basically throw down on the bed, and it looks like, I mean, it was a, they punch her in the face, and they yeah, gang they, rape her. Yeah, and they beat her up, and then the guy says some weird comment about, I didn't quite make it out, I, didn't, I wouldn't want to watch the scene again just to, like, hear what he said, but it was, like, he said something about, like, like, when he, he, so at one point he destroys her thong, or her underwear. Oh, yeah, he rips her. And he says, like, get that pussy, or something weird, like. yeah. And he's like, he's like, yeah, yeah, do her, man. And they're all like screaming and like, like that just was like, ugh, like so super uncomfortable to watch. And like the guy, the Andrew Carver guy, mm-hmm. the one bodyguard's like raping her. She's screaming. She's got blood all over her face. Like he decked her right in the face. Yeah. And he's More like licking once. her face. Yeah. And like drooling on her. Or and like, like and like, like and talking something. to her, like yeah. yelling at her, degrading her while this is going on. And they're kind of like bro cheering each other yeah and, and the other guys just... like holding her down on the other side and they're because there's three of them in the room and yeah her. and it was really graphic i yeah. mean it was like i forgot how graphic it was because this movie was in 1995 it was rated nc-17 and what i was reading on wikipedia was it was like one of the only like nc-17 movies that like had mass like um success in like theaters and like with like the general public because it is like a really graphic sexual movie. Mm-hmm. I think, like, for our standards now, it probably would just be rated R. But, like, this particular, like, like, but, I mean, so, I guess my point is that it's, I mean, we're all dead inside, apparently, because I'm watching this, like, this was NC-17, I don't know, like, this isn't, like, yeah. not necessarily the, I mean, the rape scene was horrible, I just mean the whole nudity and, and everything and the sex and stuff was just not that graphic. But this scene in particular is very sad. really graphic. Yeah, really like, graphic. On a scale from uh, Friends to Game of Thrones, you know, it's like where where this scene in particular is definitely past Game of Thrones territory. Yeah. But like the whole movie is like probably less than Game of Thrones territory if you want to like. Yeah, it wouldn't have rated to be on like HBO. that. Yeah, there's just a lot of nipples, and I guess yeah, like it's they mostly boobs. Yeah, boobs, and then like I guess there's Breasts. some like. I guess because, like, then they have their thongs off. Sometimes you can yeah. see, like, the front area, but there's no, like, Yeah, you can't. Like, there's, or... and there's no, like, zooming in shots of, like, like a woman's vaginal area. And it's all the, kind of far away. And all yeah. the men that are naked, which is, like, I think just Zach in that butt. one scene. Yeah, it's just his butt. 
and there's no no frontal, no even like shadow. Yeah. Just like just kind of from behind. But yeah, that that scene is graphic. It's hard to watch. Well, and then she like stumbles out into the party. She's like bleeding all over the place. She falls down. Nomi sees her. Um, and then like it cuts down there in the hospital. Mm-hmm. So they go in the hospital. It's like clear that she's been, you know, beaten, gang raped, all this stuff. And Nomi is like, where are the police? Like this is when she realizes that based on, you know, Zach's reaction essentially. Mm-hmm. This is not the first time this has happened. That, you know, Zach's just like, oh, well, you know, Andrew Carver will give her enough money. She can, you know, he'll pay her off, basically. And she can have her own dress dress shop. She'll be fine. Yeah. What was interesting is that maybe now we would talk about it more. But, like, nobody even said the word, like, rape. Mm-hmm. Or talked about, like, mental health. Or, like... Yeah, there was no... No me... Ne- or, not no me... Molly never even spoke. No. Again. Yeah. She didn't have any more speaking lines after that, which I... Yeah. Also thought was weird. Yeah. And then she was, like, obviously badly beaten. Nomi's like, well, you know, why aren't the police here? And Zach's response is, well, you know, he's part of, like, the club. He's in the club mm-hmm. of, you know, performers and, like, people, big-time Vegas people, basically. And he's like, you know, it's the same club that you belong to know me yeah it's interesting too watching that movie now i guess with this current political climate too because that's what it feels like on a constant basis like when things happen mm. you're like and it's and they get covered up because this these person is part of the club or that person's part of the club or whatever yeah you know and like like in harassment in clubs now is like if if it's the right customer then it's swept under the rug and it's interesting too like watching her reaction when she realizes that no one's coming to help her and yeah. no one's coming to help Molly and they're on their own basically. Mm-hmm. She kind of like, you kind of watch her heart in a little bit and then she, cause she goes from like straight horror to kind of like, okay, I get it. Not in like an accepting like, well, I guess this is what it is and I have no control. That's like when she comes up with like her plan, you kind of see like that. Like she goes from being like horrified and afraid and like feeling like out of control, like someone's going to save her okay, I guess I'm on my own and kind of going back into, like, survivor mode. Yeah, because up to this point, she thinks that Zach is her white knight. Mm -hmm. Because he's done so much for her. And I say that in quotations because, like, he's the reason that she's in the top spot now. He's the reason Uh she's the star of the show. So in her head, she thinks that he's done all these things because he likes her and he wants to be with her. Because at one point during the party, while Molly's being um, raped, there's a scene where he, like, grabs her by the chin and he's like, I think I'm falling in love with you. Mm-hmm. I don't know, that scene kind of like gets to me too thinking back on it. When he watched Nomi introduce Molly to Andrew, mm-hmm. did he know what was going to happen? I Yeah, I mean, I feel like it totally knew. Yeah, like he was like, well, that was easy. Now I don't have to find somebody because she did it for me. Mm-hmm. Not realizing that this is actually her best friend. Because then there's the scene after where he says oh if you like her then it's fine we'll take care of it yeah and yeah. she's like if i like her what do you mean by that like yeah like this elite club and molly is just like this kind of peon i guess yeah like this discardable person yeah which is also really shitty yeah but i guess that kind of just real quick to go back to the stereotype or thing that's kind of like this person is like a disposable person mm mm-hmm. So then I guess just wanted to talk about Naomi as a character and kind of focusing on her specifically. Like you kind of said before, there's no, like, real backstory. And the only clue that we kind of get to, like, what, well, where she was or what happened to her, like, in the beginning or before, like, pre the movie was when Zach, like, finds out, um, they do, like, a background check on her because she... Like, didn't want, like, there was, like, you know, you kind of knew there was, like, some other story because she didn't want to talk about where she was from. She didn't want to talk about, like, you know, she didn't want to give her social security number. She didn't want to, like, have to do any of that stuff. And when she had to, like, talk to HR or whatever Mm -hmm. to, like, register when she got hired in the showgirls show, um, she was just very, like, hesitant to kind of do that. Zach ends up coming back with, in the hospital, kind of putting her down and saying, reading off kind of this laundry list of 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 things and it's like you know 
pro, like it was like solicitation in all these different states. You know, solicitation, solicitation, solicitation. He kept saying that over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And then he's like, drug you know, charges. yeah, drug charges, um, possession, murder, or uh, uh, assault with a deadly weapon, like all these different things. And yeah, and, that, you, and you, he reveals that her parents were killed in a murder suicide. You kind of got the idea that she'd had a hard life because there is the scene when she's the going back to when she was having like dinner with Crystal and they're talking about how they used to eat dog food basically. Yeah. And then it goes into that whole thing. Yeah, she's kind of a mystery as as a character because in the in the beginning of the film like for there's a few scenes where she just kind of someone says something mean to her and she like explodes. Like, like she flips out, yeah. Yeah, she takes her reaction to the next level and mm-hmm. you're like, "Whoa." I mean, I know that was a messed up thing to say, but damn. Yeah, she's like a little tantrum. Yeah. And she, yeah, like, so freaks true. out and, like, says, like, fuck you or whatever, like, screams and runs away, like, and you're like, huh, like, there's something, you know, had to have happened in this girl's path. And then every time someone would mention, oh, so you're a whore, she would, like, freak out, I'm not a whore, I don't do that, da 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 and I, you know, when mm. we get some kind of feeling that that definitely comes from her past and like the things that she had to deal with because when Zach reveals all the stuff about her she goes I did what I had to do it, it kind of seemed like you know she was going to Vegas to like start anew mm-hmm. she didn't want to be classified as um a whore or, or a hooker she wanted to do something else mm-hmm. and according to the Wikipedia kind of like overview in the movie she's also apparently like a teenager like a really young woman. Mm-hmm. So she's what, 21, 22 yeah. maybe max? Yeah. So she's super young. She wants to like reinvent herself kind of. But yeah, I mean, she doesn't, she's fine like using her sexuality to like get ahead, but she, she wants to be in control of it. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was interesting, you know, because Zach was trying to put her down. People keep trying to put her down the whole time about. Using her body, using her sexuality, you know, doing what you doing kind of like what needs to happen to figure it out. But she's like totally on her own, other than when she meets Molly, then she kind of has like family. But then I was surprised at the end when she leaves. Yeah. So she goes and beats up the Andrew, Andrew Carver. Carver person in like this super kick ass, you know, like scene. Yeah. Beats the shit out of him. Goes back to the hospital, tells Molly she beat the shit out of Andrew, gives her a stuffed animal, gets back on the freeway, and starts hitchhiking. Yeah, and then she's headed to, the film alludes to that she's headed to Los Angeles to basically start over again. So yeah. it's like, yeah, it's interesting that she kind of abandons the only family that she creates mm-hmm. in Molly, which, I don't know, I mean, like, in real life thing, I think that was messed up because now Molly's like a like she's a victim and she has no one now. She's to totally stand alone. Up for her. And yeah. It was like a horrible. It wasn't just like she got punched. Like that's bad enough, right? She got gang raped and beat up and brutalized, and so her best friend, who's living with her, just leaves. Just abandons her. And I was really upset by that. That actually, I forgot that that's what happened at the very end when we were watching this movie and I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, that's such a selfish choice. You just bail? Yeah. And, and then when if this girl clearly needs you because she has no one. At least the film makes it seem that Molly also has no one. Yeah, she's like living in a trailer park like by herself. Yeah. And Molly doesn't get another line. Mm-mm. Which that bothered me too. Like, why doesn't Molly get to say anything? Like, where's her voice in all of that after what happened? I mean, yeah. I don't know. And I, yeah, I think that says something too about Nomi as a as a person. She is able to like take charge and be in a situation like that. But I guess when it comes to being like vulnerable, like the way that she would have to be if her and Molly continued, like if she was there for Molly when mm-hmm. Molly needed to recover and stuff, then that would require her to be more vulnerable than she has been in the entire movie. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And she's not ready for that. But that's still, like, super messed up because, like, mm-hmm. this person needs you and, like, I don't know, like, maybe if she really felt like she needed to get out of Las Vegas because she beat up Andrew Carver, fine, but she could have taken Molly with her. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I Molly would've... had a car. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I would have liked it better if, like, because I liked it that Nomi was like, you know what, I'm not going to play this game. I don't want to be in this club. This isn't what I thought it was going to be. So, all right, fine. I'm not going to, I can't make it here. All right, fine. I'm not going to make it in Vegas. Well, she kind of did when she made it and then she, like, she bailed. Mm-hmm. But it's like, but then that, that she left Molly really bothered me. Like, she should have taken her with her. I would have liked it better if they had left like kind of off really into the style. sunset. Yeah. yeah, like together. And then, and then like, it was like they're starting anew, but they have each other. They kind of have, like, I would have preferred that versus, yeah, she just kind of left her there. Yeah. I don't know. Especially, with, like, I was, I mentioned this earlier, too, is, you know, obviously, we don't know, it's a movie world, we totally made up, but, like, in real life, if something like that happened, and then the dude who perpetrated the crime gets beat up, like, in clear retaliation to the, to the crime, who do you think he's gonna go after? Especially if he has that mm-hmm. much money, and he's in the boys' club, and has that much power where it doesn't... Yeah, she's, like, leaving her completely defenseless. defenseless. Yeah, and the police aren't yeah. gonna do anything, like, Molly's as good as dead at this point. You know, and that's a horrible thing to say, but it's like, I mean, how many other women does that happen to on a regular basis where they, you know, they don't have someone to defend them against this person who's, like, clearly more powerful than them, and they just end up dead somewhere. Yeah, totally. And Like we always say, girls end up in trash cans. Yeah, or suitcases. Or suitcases, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's like, a, a very re- real fear, 100%, yeah. Um. So as far as, like, sex work, in the film, I think that Nomi, I don't know, like, I feel like she definitely used her body and her sexuality to empower herself, but I don't think she, like, even though the strip club dynamic was pretty good, like, it it didn't seem like, like, she considered that type of work empowering. Like, she definitely didn't look down on the other girls because of her Mm -hmm. past and the thing that she, then, like, obviously what she But she didn't want to do that anymore. Yeah, like, she definitely, like, I feel like we as women nowadays, or at least like you and me and the majority of the girls that we work with feel a little bit differently about the industry that we're in and like the amount of power that we actually do have using our sexuality and our looks and our bodies to like the greatest, not, that's not right. I was going to say greatest potential, but that's not it. It's like the, it's like, like monetizing to, them to the, as much as we possibly can. Yeah. Well, and but in a way that's like not as, as not as damaging to ourselves. But also I think because we're coming from a place of privilege where we could have chosen to do the stripping and we could have not chosen to become strippers or sex workers. And we feel like we had a choice between, you know, do we want to do full service? Do we just want to do lap dances? Okay, what does that mean? What do we want to do that with? Versus like Nomi's coming from a place of she desperation no yeah. where she had, well, I don't know, I don't use it as necessary desperation, but yeah, she had no choice. She had to feed herself. She had to take care of herself. That's what she could do. That's what she saw as a viable option. That was that was the viable option and the viable choice for her. So, yeah, I mean, I think that she just wanted to get to a better place where mm-hmm. she wasn't doing that. Because, yeah, I mean, she didn't... I feel like it was obvious in the movie that she, she wanted love. Yeah. She wanted safety. She wanted to make money. She wanted to be famous, successful. successful yeah. And she wanted to be a dancer and all this kind of stuff. And she didn't want to be in sex work And then she kind of ended up achieving that dream, and then, well, sort of. (laughs) In the in the word in the words of the movie, right? She didn't want to be a whore anymore, but then she goes into this profession as a professional dancer for the Stardust Hotel and Casino, and she's thinking, okay, this is going to be different. I'm a professional dancer. I'm not a whore anymore. And then she ends up being like, wow, I'm the it's I'm the exact I'm in the exact same position. It just has a better a better outfit or whatever. Yeah. And Crystal kind of says that too. She's like, you know, she's kind of telling her like, well, we're all whores, you know. You sell it, and someone buys it, basically. Mm-hmm. And Nomi really pushes back against that, but then it kind of comes full circle in the end, where it's like, yeah, well, you're still doing the exact same thing. You're maybe just getting paid more. It's kind of in a different venue. Yeah. And that was interesting because I do think that, unfortunately, like women, we just get treated the same in the strip club and, you know, when you work at a coffee shop or when you're working in an office, you know, it's like different, different language, different ways of being treated. Mm -hmm. But in, in the end, it's kind of the same idea. Yeah. Not always. I'm not saying, you know, every place of employment is like that, but... I definitely feel, have felt that way. Yeah, like, yeah, it doesn't really matter, like, if you work at a clothing store or mm-hmm. whatever. Like, if, if that 
man has decided that he's going to treat you like this because you're he feels that you're less than because of your position it doesn't really matter where you are yeah yeah and you don't you're powerless and you're punished for your sexuality Mm -hmm. no matter what you do yeah so yeah well all in all did you like the movie yes 10 out of 10 would watch again. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's fast forward past the one part. Yeah, I liked it. I thought it was good. But Well, now we're going to watch uh, the second one, which is Pennies from Heaven, which focuses on... on Penny. Penny, the minor, totally no big deal character. I don't know why they even fucking made a second movie and focused on her. They should have focused on Nomi when she goes to... Los, Los Angeles. Angeles. Yeah. Or Molly. Or Molly. Yeah. And like what happened to Molly after that? Because I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Right. Real two. Do you have any last words for our movie? <laughs> no, but I would recommend watching it. And uh, yeah, see what you think. That's all we have for you mortals today. Big thank you to the Scarlet Space Babe for joining me. To soothe your aching loins, find us on Instagram at Babes of Valhalla. And you can always reach us at Babes of Valhalla at gmail.com. Until next time, stay nasty. Babes of Valhalla is written and produced by the Babes of Valhalla, otherwise known as your illustrious lieges Darby and Charlie. Music provided by the musical genius Gemini Genesis.